The first section is when my heroine, Yasmin Khan, meets the guy she ends up having a rather tumultuous relationship with throughout the uh, World War II years. In Kolkata, or Calcutta, India, 1941, she is a courtesan's daughter. Um, she's descended from a very distinguished house. Uh, courtesans are not prostitutes. They're, I guess, the mo uh, they're like geishas. You know, they entertain, they're usually very uh, well-educated, well-spoken, artistic, and political. And, um, and some of these women uh, were very independent and, and chose not to be married and tied into anything that uh, resembled the patriarchy. Um, so she's the daughter of a celebrated courtesan, but Yasmin doesn't like to flirt, is tone deaf, and can't dance. So her mother says, obviously courtesanship is not for you, but nobody's probably going to marry you, so you need to figure out what to do. So she ends up opening a nightclub in Calcutta, when she observes American GIs coming into the city on their way to Burma and realizes that they're going to need entertainment. So she opens a club called Bombay Duck, which is a fish, but that's another story. <laughs> okay, so here she's meeting Edward for the first time. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. A thunderstorm was on its way. The thought of this made Yasmin happy. When the rains came, it seemed as if the sky was going to burst at any moment, filling every depression with water. Like most Bengalis, Yasmin loved the rain. At night, she fell asleep easily to the sound of water running off the tin roofs. To her, the rains always brought with them a hint of some great excitement. The thunderstorms could wreak havoc, but there was also promise in the rains. Afterwards, everything was in Hollywood Technicolor. The trees were greener, the bougainvillea more vividly hot pink and orange, the air smelled fresher, not a mean feat in Calcutta. She believed that being surrounded by fertility and growth made people more romantic. It reflected the Bengali nature, lugubrious but still hopeful, and inclined towards poetry. It was one of the few times Yasmin felt at home in the place where she was born. Maybe that was why the vision of a man walking towards her in the damp air made her feel like a heroine in a movie. It was like she was waiting for her lover to arrive, and he finally had. She didn't see his face at first. She saw his form, and that was enough to make her keep watching. He was tall and broad-shouldered and had an easy gait. He was dressed in his officer's uniform. When he came closer, she saw from his uniform that he was American. One hand was in a pocket, the other held an almost finished cigarette and a slip of paper that he peered at under the street lamp. He wore glasses. When he loosened his tie, looked up and saw Yasmin standing under the sign, his handsome boyish face broke into a smile. His voice was deep. Uh, Salam alaikum, he said, or namaste. <laughs> a simple hello will suffice, Yasmin said. The Americans always tried a bit too hard. <laughs> Phew, English. <laughs> My name is Edward. He held out his hand. Hello. Hello yourself, she replied. His hand was warm and dry, something she would always remember. It was hard to come by a dry hand in such a damp place, she would think later. I'm Yasmin. That's a nice name, Jasmine. Uh, no, Yasmin. Same difference, I suppose. Funnily, I know the Bengali word for Jasmine, Edward said after a moment. He paused again, as if unsure he should continue. Well, go on then, Yasmin said. Belly full, he said, and smiled at her winningly. It was one of the first words I learned because my wife loves gardening and I wanted to tell her about it. Plus, it was easy to remember. Belly full, like a full tummy, he added, rubbing his stomach to demonstrate. <laughs> Yasmin heard the word wife and was disappointed. It's more like belly fool, she said softly. Would you happen to know why there is a fish hanging in front of a club that is called Bombay Duck, he asked after she offered nothing more. Bombay Duck is a kind of fish, she said. Ah, oh, I kept looking for a duck. He glanced at his watch. Am I keeping you from something? Not at all, he said. I was supposed to meet my pal here, and I'm a little late because I got confused about the duck and the fish. It's one of those Indian things, I guess. I must have passed this place six times. Yes, foreigners always think that India is a great paradox, Yasmin said, when really it's just like any place, just a bit more so. A bit more so what, he asked. A bit more so everything, loud, hot, smelly, crowded. 
I've never been anywhere else, so I'm just assuming. But from what I see in the movies and the newsreels, other places seem very different, yes, he said. Cleaner. I haven't traveled that much either, he said. But yes, Calcutta is very different from Norwich, Connecticut. Dustier. Everything here is covered in a thin layer of dust. That's where I'm from, Norwich, he added after a moment. I should go inside, Yasmin said. She didn't want to go back in. She wanted to stand outside in the thick night and keep talking to the American, even though beads of sweat were forming under her breasts and above her lip. And he had a wife back home who knew the Bengali equivalent to her name. Yeah, you shouldn't keep your date waiting, Edward said. I'm sure he's wondering where you are. Yasmin smiled. You're the one who's late, and I don't have a date. He was still smiling at her, but his expression had changed. Oh, of course not, he said. I beg your pardon? Oh boy, what I meant was, of course, no respectable unmarried Bengali woman would be outside a nightclub smoking with me. What I mean is, you should not keep your husband waiting. Men had the same, mis same misplaced propriety, be they American or Indian, and the urgent need to put a woman in a neat category that they could then cope with while betting them. She was either someone's whore or someone's wife. There was no in-between, Yasmin reflected. She decided then and there she was not going to make it easy for him. She looked at him, challenging him. Go on then, she said silently. Try and figure out which one I am, whore or wife. Edward took off his hat and wiped his brow. You know, the Calcutta Key never talked about this. What's that, Yasmin said. A manual on how to discreetly navigate the Indian <coughs> female mind. Yasmin raised her eyebrows. Not even Indian men know how to do that. <laughs> well, you're a native and a woman. That's what we call a double whammy back home. <laughs> he grinned at her. I have to go in now, she said. I guess you don't like to flirt much, huh? Oh, is that what we were doing? <laughs> Ouch, Edward said and shook his head. The door opened. Two officers, English, walked out, tipped their hats to Yasmin, and did not give Edward a passing glance as they proceeded down the street. Music wafted outside as neither made a move to go in. It was patience. Singing smoke gets in your eyes. Looks like a hopping club, Edward said. My buddy raves about this place, he added, when Yasmin remained silent. She turned around and walked back into the club, leaving Edward standing outside, holding his hat in a hand, puzzled by what had just occurred. <laughs> This next bit is sort of, I guess what we call in screenwriting, the inciting incident. <laughs> um, so Yasmin um, has gone back into the club and, and now she has to deal with some club management issues. Abil Babu gently tapped Yasmin on the shoulder. What is it, she said, and she sighed. There are some customers who wish to come in, he said still very quiet. His face, as usual, was impassive. So let them in, Yasmin said, annoyed. Have I ever disturbed you if it was not necessary? No, I suppose not. Please come to the back. Three American soldiers stood in the alley smoking. One said something and the other two laughed loudly. Now Asma was singing Stormy Weather, and they stopped to listen, their heads bowed as if praying. Yasmin watched them listen. Not bad, one of them said. Almost like home, another one added wistfully. Almost, the third one said. They turned to Yaksi, Yasmin, and Adil Babu watching them. All three immediately took off their caps. Two of them stubbed their fingers out under their feet. Namaste, ma'am, the first one who had spoken said. He was the tallest of the three. He looked Yasmin over in open appreciation and broke into a wide smile, displaying a row of gleaming, if somewhat crooked, white teeth. As if in support of his friend's opinion, one of the other men whistled softly. The third man, who looked younger than his companions and was lighter skinned, almost white, and like patience, could have passed for white, was quiet. He finished his cigarette and looked away. Yasmin saw his jaw tighten. She thought suddenly that it must be almost harder for him, being so obviously from both worlds and with only, as the horrible expression went, a touch of the tar brush. But that was enough to be considered and viewed as calvo forever. Yasmin's heart beat a little faster. Their faces were so hopeful. We were wondering if it would be possible, ma'am, to sneak us in and let us sit in the back. We're engineers, ma'am. We have money, another one interrupted. He, yelled, he held out a handful of rupees. It's not about that, she said very softly. 
There was a burst of laughter from inside the club, and the band started up a new number. Yasmin hated turning people away for no good reason. No one would even notice us, ma'am, the first one said. Yasmin looked at Abu Babu. Why shouldn't they come in, she said to him in Bengali. They're paying customers. You know why, Abu Babu replied. He looked over her shoulder at the young men who were politely looking away. Abu Babu, there is nothing separating us from them, she said. You think I don't know that, he said. It's ridiculous, but it's the law. I'm doing this tonight. Tomorrow, while I'm walking down the street, I will have to step aside if a Britisher walks close to me. Yasmin looked at the young men again. She could tell that the light-skinned one was proud and that somehow made it worse. He made no eye contact with anyone. He looked down the alley as his friends pleaded to be let in. You can't come in, she said finally, but you can stay and listen, and we will serve you. Leave this door open, Adilabu, and send Rahul to take their orders. Yasmin, Adilabu began. They can stay, she said firmly, but you have to sit here, she told the men, where no one can see you. We will bring you chairs and drinks and food, whatever you need, on the house. Thank you, one of them called after Yasmin as she walked away. She could hear them talking. Man, Tommy, did you see that piano? What you wouldn't do, what you wouldn't give just to get hold of that piano. Did you see it? Yeah, I saw it. Maybe if she hears you play, shut your mouth, boy. Better than nothing. I'd rather take nothing. Oh, come on now, Tommy, it's not bad. We can hear the music, and she said, on the house. Sitting in the alley like a stray-ass dog. You said it yourself, all the comforts of home. Yasmin stopped to listen at the laughter. How could they laugh, she wondered. How often they must be humiliated like this. I'm paying, I don't care about on the house. Suit yourself. She's beautiful. She's as colored as me. Quiet, Tom. Come on now. Inside, Yasmin gestured to Radhika to come to her. Go to the kitchen. Abil Babu will hand you a tray of food and drinks. If, it get, if it's too much, get Rahul to help you. Radhika nodded. Take the tray to the alley, but don't walk through the club. Exit from the kitchen and go to the back. Yes, I think Rahul will have to help you. Radhika nodded again, puzzled. Yasmin waited for her to ask a question and was grateful when she didn't. She liked this about Radhika. The girl was in, wasn't inquisitive, even when confused. There are three American servicemen in the alley awaiting food and drink. After you give them the tray, make sure the back door is left ajar so they can hear the music, but not enough so that they can see anyone or anyone can see them. I'll meet you there in a moment. Don't talk to them. Do you understand? The girl nodded and left to fetch the tray. But Yasmin forgot to meet Radha Gamrahu in the alley. Two distracting things happened. She was swept into a conversation with an English officer and his drunkenly hostile wife about Darjeeling versus Assamese tea. And every time she attempted to extricate herself from the conversation, she was prevented from leaving and could only do so when they started to bicker amongst themselves after the wife posited that he loved Assamese tea chiefly because he had an Assamese mistress. <laughs> Yasmin felt that she could escape them, only to be faced with a disgruntled Asma who was refusing to go back on stage because patients had said she sounded flat during the last set. Why must you torment her, Yasmin demanded of Patience. Patience shrugged one perfectly golden shoulder and said, I have no idea what you're on about. I said she must be coming down with the cold because she sounded a bit creaky. No, you said flat, Asma said. Flat, I've never been flat in my life. Patience's eyes moved down to Asma's arguably flat chest and she smiled. <laughs> Asma gasped and crossed her arms over her chest and said to Yasmin, I'm retiring for the evening. <laughs> You are doing no such thing, Queen Victoria, Yasmin said. I can replace you. She looked at Patience. I can replace both of you. That's not true, Ducky, and you know it, Patience said, after Asma reluctantly took to the stage. She kissed Yasmin on the cheek. I know, Yasmin said, but Asma doesn't. She's one of the best dancers in the club. She is a, a shudra, or a dalit, or what you would call the lowest caste in India, the untouchable. But Yasmin doesn't care because she's a hell of a dancer. <laughs> um, just to give you some um, context of who Yasmin um, was employing, who Radhika is. So this is a little bit about Radhika's background. As the months wore on, Radhika became more and more laconic, isolating herself and not taking her meals with the others. She had also stopped dancing. 
Every morning, Yasmin would ask her if she was ready to perform that evening. And every morning, the girl would shake her head, pull her dopatta, lower her to cover her face, and skulk away. She's costing me money every day, Yasmin complained to Adobo. A little kindness, Yasmin, he would say. She has no mother, be gentle. Well, I'm not anyone's mother, Adilbabu, and I'm a businesswoman. Yasmin, Yasmin had an image in her head of what Radhika's mother must have been like. A hard-working, lean woman who toiled in the rice paddies next to her husband, uncomplaining and stoic. This was one kind of Indian woman, of a certain class. Nothing like the languid, almost laissez-faire types Yasmin grew up with, who had honed, asif, who had honed gossip and conversation, a distinctly Bengali style of conversation into an art form took long naps in the afternoon, and knew how to tell entire stories with their bodies without uttering a word. Yasmin suspected Radhika's mother was so beaten down by life that she rarely showed her daughter affection. The girl was the youngest performer at the duck, and Yasmin knew she should try to be more like an elder sister or even a maternal figure to her. Why the men responded so well to Radhika, though that was a question that puzzled everyone really. There were certain women that other women found beautiful, but men did not. And then there were women like Radhika, whose appeal was baffling to those of her own gender. Radhika's body was slim and supple, but she lacked radiance. Her dark skin had no luster. Her eyes were her best feature, as it is with most dancers, and she used them to talk to the audience. And sometimes when she danced, her braid came undone, rippled in waves underneath the dopatta. But she was not what could be described as beautiful. For instance, Patience, who was half Irish, half Indian, was considered a great beauty. Her skin was like burnished gold. Her dark hair did not fall limply down her back as Radhika sometimes did, but was bouncy and cut just above her shoulders with poofy bangs like Betty Grable's, which was what Patience wanted. Patience sang skillfully and could perform a shimmy that elicited wolf whistles from many of her male fans. She was not a sonorous singer, but could carry a tune and banter easily with the audience and the musicians, like any seasoned Broadway star. There was something vaguely American about Patience, and that was what Yasmin knew would make her money. It added just the right flavor to the club. She was a survivor, and tender when she needed to be, tough when she called for it, just like Betty Davis and now Voyager, as Patience never failed to point out. And yet, it was Radhika who packed them in every night. What struck Yasmin was that Radhika was born a Dalit, and therefore she, out of everyone, knew exactly where she stood in Indian society. She was born in a village near Noakali, whose inhabitants believed implicitly in the caste system. At least the Brahmins did. The lower caste did not have the wherewithal to disagree, but there was one point with which all the castes were in agreement. Nothing was lower than a Muslim. And Radhika had committed an egregious sin. She had shared a meal with one, a step below an untouchable, and was thus disowned by her family and banished from the village. As Radhika told it, there was an enormous peepul tree about a kilometer outside the village, it had had time to grow since it was over 300 years old and was considered sacred by the villagers. It stood 40 feet high and its trunk was nine feet around. For many years, a man had lived in the lower branches until one day he abruptly fell out of it, stone dead. The villagers had fed him, leaving food at the foot of the tree. The meaner children had sometimes mocked and tormented him by belting him with rocks and fruit. Usually, he just climbed onto a higher branch, but once in a while, he would let loose and urinate on them, hooting the whole time, and the children would run away screaming. After she was banished, Radhika decided to hang herself from that tree. She fashioned a noose with her dopatta and wrapped it around her neck and hanged herself. Her bladder emptied, and she lost consciousness. When she woke, she was on the ground. A dirty man with gnarled hair and in a white loincloth staring down at her. He squatted next to her with a concerned expression on his face. When she opened her eyes, he said, not yet, and walked away. Radhika assumed it was the ghost of the old man who had lived in the tree, or as her Muslim friend Fariba, the one who she had been banished for, thought, a kindly jinn who lived in the tree and saved many from suicide attempts and dockites. When Yasmin heard it, she loved this story, but she told Patience, God knows if it is true. Who really cares? It's a delicious Indian tale, Patience said. <coughs> And I always knew that Radhika was interesting. Maybe she's possessed by that jinn. Adil Babu has said as much when he found the girl wandering the streets, dehydrated and in real danger of being abducted by gundas, and brought her in. She seems quite haunted, he said, but that doesn't mean she cannot assist me in the kitchen. When Adil Babu brought Radhika in, it seemed apparent that she was not meant to be much more than a maid. 
No one knew anything about the girl's history, and Radhika did not share any details about her life. Yasmin did not let that deter her. She always prided herself on being above things as petty as caste and race, and constantly lamented how mired Indian society was in social strata. It was easy to blame the Brits for it, but they had not invented the caste system after all. Yasmin had inspected the girl carefully, noting her teeth, yellow, with two terrible cavities that made her breath stink, and pallor, ashen from lack of food. Her fingernails were bitten down and her toenails were long and dirty. Her heels were cracked with dirt embedded in the cracks because she had no shoes. There was no indication that she could dance, or even wanted to dance. The first two days, the girl refused to sleep in a bed. It was too soft and gave her a sore back, she said. She rolled her thin cotton quilt out onto the hard cement floor and slept on top of it until Patience and Madhu coaxed her onto a string charcoal that was so sunken in the middle her bum grazed the floor. All day Radhika squatted in the kitchen doing whatever was required of her. Adil Babu's assistant, Nyla, protested at first, saying the kitchen was too small for three people to be moving around in it, but soon came around and she realized she could tell the girl what to do. Mostly Radhika sliced fish meat in the old-fashioned way on a scimitar-shaped blade that was mounted on a block of wood and set between her legs, and washed dishes in two large metal bins, one for soaking and one for rinsing. She did it uncomplainingly. She never smiled, never asked questions, other than how small do you want these pieces, or should I throw out the fish eggs? Adil Babu, who was still the main cook in the club at the time, before he started assisting in the front, and that grumpy Nyla took over, figured out that she especially liked fish eggs. He would fry them in the sack for her with butter, a dash of turmeric and onions. She ate them with rice. She ate very little. She was accustomed to deprivation and expecting little from life. So this is um, totally different now. We're going in a different direction. Now it's um, somewhat about the war a little bit, and uh, well, not really, but it's about Edward, Edward and Radhika, uh, not Radhika, rather, Yasmin at this point, they've fallen in love, and Edward is trying to be useful to Radhika. Rahul has run off in heartbreak because Radhika has left the club, and um, he's acting out, and so Edward has gone in search of Rahul to bring him back to the club. <clears throat> For one full week, Edward dedicated all his free time to locating Rahul. Sorry, Rahul is the young bearer in the club, you know, who works, brings tea, does all the errands, and so on. For one full week, Edward dedicated all his free time to locating Rahul. What he determined was that, first, Rahul had gone looking for Radhika, and unable to find her, gone to the base to enlist the aid of his friend, Corporal Addison, who had sent two MPs looking for her. When they too could not locate her, Rahul, in despair, had fled to his village, several hundred miles away. Edward made the arduous two-day journey to East Bengal with Addison in tow. His baffled CO granted him permission on the condition that they would not delay their return. You'll be considered AWOL if you are not back in 72 hours, Lieutenant, he was told. You are also responsible for Corporal Addison. When they finally found him, a despondent Rahul seemed to have lost weight. The sight of two dusty and weary Americans, the first they had ever seen, entering the sleepy village of Lakshmipur, which had electricity only at the police station and post office, sent shockwaves through the houses. However, Rahul's young mother, a tiny, wiry woman, was relieved to see Edward in Addison. She had been praying to the goddess for something to lift her only son out of his despair and send him back to work, where he belonged, earning for his family. Rahul refused to even look at his friends and lay list listlessly with his back to them on a juke mat on the floor of his mother's one-room house, as almost every resident of Lakshmi Pool crowded around the entrance to her tiny dwelling clogging up the courtyard just outside the house, peering in and at times weighing in. She's just a dame, like any other dame. There's more where that came from, Addison said, in what he hoped was a soothing manner. I don't think that'll ease his mind, Edward said. Let's go on the assumption that she was the love of his life. Addison scratched his head and sighed. Well, then he's screwed, he said. <laughs> also, not particularly helpful, Edward said. He leaned down and put his hand on the boy's shoulder. Hey kid, your heart is broken, he said, and it will always be a little bit broken where she is concerned, but if you don't get up and face it, you'll die. He paused and looked at Rahul's family members crouched around him, and it looks to me like you have more than yourself to think about. Rahul's mother, Nandini, who was only 14 years older than her son, somehow knew exactly what the American was saying. Hey, listen to the side, she cried, roughly nudging her boy. You will find another girl better than this one. 
Why did Yasmin G discharge her? Because she was bad news, that's why. She might have tainted us with her bad luck if she had entered here as a bride. Thank Yasmin G for saving you. Even the insult aimed his beloved's way did not rouse Rahul. Listen to the Americans, one village elder admonished, and the rest of Rahul's neighbors murmured in both agreement or disagreement. Edward and Addison walked out of the tiny house and into the courtyard and pondered their options. They were weary and hungry. The children and some adults crowded around them, staring at them in open curiosity. Both Americans were used to being scrutinized by Indians at close quarters. Almost without thinking, they took out Hershey's bars and Wrigley's gum packets out of their knapsacks and handed them out to the children pressing up against them. <coughs> we can't stay here much longer, sir, Addison said. We'll be AWOL by tomorrow night. I know, but let's just give him a minute. He's young, Edward said. I promised Yasmin I would bring him home. He added, sighing. Addison grinned at him knowingly. Okay, I got you, he said. You're all about the dames too, sir. <laughs> Easy, corporal, Edward said laughing. A small girl of about three, wearing only a grimy pair of underpants, tugged on Edward's hand and he picked her up. She had large, watery brown eyes that stared at him. They appraised one another for a bit while she sucked her thumb. I think you got yourself an admirer, sir, Addison said. Hmm, not sure, she doesn't seem that impressed, Edward replied. One thing I have learned about Bengali girls, they're hard to please. Both men looked towards the hut where Rahul lay on the floor, still unwilling to emerge. Addison let out a tired sigh and lit a cigarette. The little girl suddenly extracted her thumb from her rosebud mouth and touched Edward's cheek and grinned at him. She had exactly two minuscule teeth. You see, Addison said, she likes you. Maybe there's hope for me yet, Edward said. Got any more stuff? Addison extracted another Hershey's bar from his knapsack and handed it to the child, who refused it and buried her face in Edward's neck. Aw, oh, Mouse, it's okay, Edward said. Go ahead. The soothing tone to Edward's voice made her less shy. She held out her small, dirty hand, and Addison placed the chocolate in it. The moment passed, and the toddler decided she had quite enough and wriggled to, let loo to be let loose. Edward set her gently on the ground, and she ran off confidently, swollen belly protruding, holding up her sagging underpants with one hand. She, she, she seemed to know where she was going. No adult came to claim her. Look at that. Not even a goodbye and I'll promise to write, Addison said. <laughs> Typical, Edward said. He looked around the village. Off to one side, there was an enormous banyan tree. Around it was a raised mound ringed by crumbling white bricks. Below the tree sat a clay statue of the goddess Lakshmi. She was pink-faced, her large almond-shaped eyes ringed with black. A small smile played on her red lips. On her lap and strewn all around her were new and old offerings of marigold and fruits. Next to her was an earthen pitcher with a coconut on top. She also wore a garland of fresh jasmine around her neck. Incense burned at her feet. He walked towards the statue to get a closer look. Not too pretty, huh? Addison said. He, he, as well as several villagers, had followed Edward to the tree. Oh, I don't know, Edward said. She's got something. One boy, about ten, stepped forward. Look he, he said, pointing to the statue. That her name, Addison said? The boy shrugged. I think this is Lakshmi, Edward said the goddess of wealth. Her? Addison said. He looked at yet Lakshmi's tranquil and somewhat garish face skeptically. I guess this is a Hindu village, Edward said. He looked around at the faces peering at him and a small chill went up his back. Addison, noticing a change in Edward's expression, said, what's up, sir? Nothing, I got a weird feeling is all. Like? Not sure. I mean, there are Hindus in a predominantly Muslim area. Can't be good. They're surrounded. Things go south fast around here. One local politician calls for a strike or a protest or something, and that's it. Fifty villagers have their throats slit. They've been living here forever, I bet, Addison said, looking around the village. Some of whom, looking around at the villagers, some of whom smiled at him. Addison grinned back and dug around in his knapsack for most more candy bars. <coughs> Sorry, plum out. Things feel so fleeting sometimes, Edward said, gazing at the idol's face. Sir, no disrespect, but we gotta get a move on here. Nandini, thinking the Americans were preparing to leave without her son, let out a frustrated yelp and grabbed her son by the ear, all but dragging him out of the hut into the courtyard. You will be the death of us, she cried. This startled both Americans, and they reached out to help Rahul. They could not touch her without offending everyone in the village, however. Easy, Mom, Addison said when Nandini shoved him away. She was surprisingly strong for someone so small. Moms, he said, shaking his head. Same everywhere. Rahul was finally on his feet. He rubbed his sore ear. Edward put his arm around the forlorn boy. Yasmin needs you, Edward said. I know you don't understand me, but everyone misses you. Adil Babu, the girls. Patience said you're leaving has thrown all the planets into the fifth house or something. 
That sounds pretty bad. <laughs> Though Rahul didn't fully understand, he comprehended enough, so he just nodded. Nandini glared at the, the blue-eyed Addison. You're all useless, she said in Bengali, while Addison grinned at her. Stop coddling him and force him to come with you. You're welcome, Addison said slowly, putting his palms together in a namaste. Nandini rolled her eyes, covered her head, and stalked back into the house, muttering to herself. A moment later, she marched out, handed Rahul a packet with four stale chapatis, and ordered all three on their way. Jao, she said, pointing to the jeep. Not for some low girl, she said directly to her son. Are you allowed to fall apart? who was my professor, who took me aside on those nights and said, Sharpie, you must ignore, you must ignore that. Um, that you don't have to write about those things simply because you happen to be from that culture, or that ethnicity. So unfortunately, what those students were, you know, they were mirroring was the traditional publishing world. So if I wrote something that, just because I loved it and I wanted to write about it, I came back, things came back to me like, can you write more like Jim Polari? That's an actual um, message I got from an editor. Can you write more like Jitra Banerjee Deva Karimi? Or can you write more about arranged marriages? And that's what we're, we're really looking for. So that's been a struggle, you know? Um, so my experience has been a little bit different. Yeah. I want to um, do a follow-up question on that. It yeah. seems that um, it's kind of a blessing and a curse to have um, you know, to, to be able to pull on some form of identity uh, mm -hmm. in your writing. That's a very good way of putting it. I mean, you know, I, I, I know for myself that, you know, being able, being sort of pigeonholed as a gay writer for yes. the longest time, it's like, I really want to write about Black Bear in the New Jersey forest, but yeah. then, like, it's like, where's the gay angle of that? Yeah. <laughs> Are there gay bears? Yeah. Where's the gay bears? Yeah. But the thing is, after a while, I gave into it because, yeah, it was working. Yes, well, so that's great. I'm I tried. Yeah. I wrote stories like that, and they were awful. They were really bad, but one of them got published, and it's not good. <laughs> but it's you know it's what they wanted, you know. So yes, uh, uh, yes. Um, You've obviously done a lot of research into the background of this story. Mm -hmm. um, where would you say you did, like, how would you actually begin to really research into the, into the subjects that you want to write about? No, oh, that's a great question. So the, what I knew least about was the China-Burma-India theater of war. And because there, there's entire past uh, chapters where we see Edward in Burma, in the jungle fighting. And so I really needed to get the timeline right, so there was very specific battles and skirmishes that happened 
1941 and 42 that needed to be highlighted. So I had I started with the thing I knew the least about, and sort of built out from there. And it took a lot. It took a lot. And even after I will confess, even after this got accepted for publication, the fact checking team and the editors came back to me several times and said, unfortunately, Sharbu, the battle you've spoken about didn't occur in July, just throwing it a day, July of 1943. It actually happened in August of 42, so you're going to have to change that. You know, I, I got confused a little bit sometimes, because like, uh, I don't outline. Even though I make all my students outline, I will outline from now on. But yeah, so. And then I, uh, and then a lot of it was just what I picked up, you know, when you love something, you absorb it without even realizing it, you know? Like song lyrics, you know? So. Yes, yes. Oh, no, Sam was next. Oh, All right, so you said this took you 15 years to finish. Yeah. Can you think of a specific moment where you could re like exhaled and thought like it was worth it? Like it's oh, yeah. I mean, I. It's definitely worth it. I mean, the reason it took 15 years is because, like I told you, I didn't really understand. Like, remember I wrote 125 pages really quickly, then I scrapped it, and I had to start over. And then life got in the way. I had a child, <laughs> a very lovely child, but still he was a toddler for what seemed like a really long period of time. Um, and I had, you know, I, I got divorced. I, I did so many things that got in the way. And then I got Quantico. I got an agent, and I was, making really great uh, um, progress in the novel, and then I got Quantico, and that seemed like I should really jump at that, you know, experience. So that took up a year and it's changing my life, so, you know. Um, I exhaled, I don't know, I exhale every day. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, what was your process in making your composite characters? Um, my composite characters? Like the, oh, the yeah, amalgam people? Yeah. Well, okay, so Yasmin, the main character, that's a great question. Yasmin, the main character, is, I, track, I, I wanted to make her from a specific part of East Bengal, which is a coastal town called Chittagong, and it's on the Bay of Bengal. And in order to do that, I had to sort of research, were there any courtesans who had settled, court, courtesan families who had settled in the area. So things like that, I would take geography, I would take ethnicity, religion. You know, India is so varied. There's 154 dialects, and there's you know so many different religions and traditions. So once I identified what ethnicity or religion or dialect I wanted, then I sort of built the character from there. Patience is Anglo-Indian. That's very specific. Yeah. You know, half white, half um, South Asian. <laughs> and Asma is Farsi. So she was, you know, she was very different. And then Radhika is a Dalit or a, a, a untouchable. So that was specific, you know? So that's how I went about it. Yes. Yes. What's your actual writing process? <laughs> well, I'm a very, very undisciplined person. So I had to force it on myself. So John Updike said three hours or 1,100 words a day. You don't get up until you've written that much. That seemed like reasonable to me. So that's what I do. I, literally, it's very, I, I write for three hours a day, or now I've pushed it to 3,000 words, and I don't move until I've done that. Where do you do it at home? I do it, I do it everywhere. That, that's another thing, once you say, once you, say it's three hours or 3,000 words, you can do it anywhere. You just have to deliver that, you have to do that for three hours or 3,000 words. So notice 3,000 words takes an hour and a half. And then you just stop. You have to stop, that's the key, for me at least. So I can do it anywhere, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Taylor. All right, this isn't like a groundbreaking question, but like, what was like the decompression like after writing for 15 years? Like that seems like, the come down would be an experience all of the time. There was no come down because I went into something else immediately. Like I had to like start working on the play, then I got hired to write a pilot that was set in 11th century Spain. <laughs> so I had to write 11th century Southern Spanish poetry. I, and I did it because it's a creative challenge, you know? So I didn't have any come down, I didn't have any decompression. I don't know. I don't know if you ever decompress because once you so you write the thing right, and then you you then you have to go about trying to get it published. That's its own sort of thing, right? Then you get a publishing deal, and 
then you have to edit it, and then you get, then it's out there, and then, then it's a whole big foo for all. So you never decompress. You know? Guess what I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Is anyone else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, because this has been a project that's taken up so much time, during that time, was there ever a time where you wanted to kind of stop, or was it from the get go this was something that you were going to see completed? I think this was something I was going to see completed. Yeah. yeah. Was there ever a time that? Did want to stop or yeah, I mean, I always want to stop. Yeah. <laughs> I hate writing, but what is it Dorothy Parker said? I hate writing. I love having written. Mm -hmm. That's very true. I think all of the writers can, you know, relate to that. There's moments where you're just like, what am I doing? I should have gone to law school. You know, I took the LSAT. <laughs> <laughs> I did well in associative reasoning. <laughs> so I'm good at Jeopardy. <laughs> But yeah, I really, you know, it, it, there's times that I just don't want to write at all, but I don't just, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, I am working on a new novel. And it's much shorter, and I'm writing much faster. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I actually said, this turned out to be 444 pages. And, I, and I, when my editor told me that, I was like, no, that's, that can't be. She goes, yep. It's 440. This is after I cut 20,000 words. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot. So I set a word limit for myself for my new novel, and it's like 90,000 words. And I've written 70,000 in a, a year. And that's starting and stopping. So I'm moving. I learned a lot from this. Like, I learned a lot from what I don't want to do anymore, mm -hmm. which is write for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah.